24. Amen. Luke chapter 24. And I do want to say uh, to all those that helped make the family day a success, thank you very much. Amen. It was wonderful. Everybody worked so hard and uh, put their best foot forward. We had several visitors that came and uh, went through the open house and saw the things that happened over there and Sunday school things that happen over here and uh, our visitors enjoyed themselves and I've said it many many times but uh, thank you to all those that have done uh, that worked and cooked brother Garrett brother uh, Kevin for cooking and, and brother Kevin brought that big grill that was a big help and just everybody that had anything to do with community day thank you so much amen for putting it all together and uh, it was a, it was a great time and uh, sister amber put together the the open house we're so thankful for that p wave did a great job uh, but it was a good day we had a lot of fun amen ate a lot of good food and and uh it was great great time and uh just all the everything the bread that was donated that was so awesome we just i could go on and on the great things that that uh, that took place that day but the greatest thing is is that we reached people we reached people people know that there's a church here that loves them and loves god whether they ever come to church here or not See, that's what we have to get we we gauge our success oftentimes by thinking well okay who comes to church see we think that sister jenny that kind of we play around with that all the time well we had 100 visitors and nobody came nobody came back to church on sunday well here's the thing that's not how you gauge success let, let, let me help you out with it of all the people that follow jesus the thousands upon thousands of people that followed him when he was handing out bread when he was curing diseases when he was hanging and dying on a cross there was hardly anybody there when it came time to commit and to sacrifice so do we gauge then the success of the ministry of Jesus Christ a failure because there weren't thousands and thousands at the cross begging that he be taken down no we don't do that the success is because he loved them and the success for this church come on somebody the success for this church is because we love them amen so we do what we do because we love them amen today's Pentecost Sunday I pray that you help me pray as I deliver this word to you today Luke chapter 24 beginning with verse number 44 amen Luke 24 beginning with verse 44 and he said unto them these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled everybody say all things which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me they opened then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus it is written and thus it is behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses of these things and behold I send the promise of my father unto you but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high and he led them as far as to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them it came to pass while he blessed them that he parted from them was parted from them and carried up into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy now watch and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God amen amen he led them to Bethany the day of Pentecost is coming we need you to get ready for what's about to come how many are thankful for Pentecost today how many are thankful for one God apostolic Jesus name baptism how many are thankful for the washing away of sins come on somebody for the infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost with a speaking of other tongues if you're thankful for Pentecost I want you to shout hallelujah thank you Jesus God bless you amen you may be seated amen thank you so much for standing and worshiping the Lord in the house of God today now I'm sure that most of you have probably seen the advertisements 
or the commercials of Christmas time where people look out their window and there in the driveway is a brand new shiny Lexus. And they put a great big larger than life red velvet bow on top. Anybody seen those advertisements? Big bow on top. I don't know about you, but I've often wondered, I would like to meet somebody that actually received that Christmas gift. Before I go any further, anybody here today have received a Lexus for Christmas? How about just a car in your driveway on Christmas besides the one you already have? Nobody? See, that to me, when I look at that, I think, wouldn't that be just amazing? I'm just throwing out some hints here. Just trying to be very open right now, Sister Maroney. Wouldn't it be wonderful to look out your window and to see that brand new car? And then I get to thinking, Brother Donnie, how difficult it would be for a person to look out into their driveway and see that shiny new Lexus. And they go and they, they touch the car and how shiny it is and how nice it is, just the feel of that new finish. You know, that's way better than the one that you've got with the rust holes in it in your old car. And they open up the door and that new car smell. You know something, nothing beats a new car smell. I mean, just to be honest with you, that's about 50% of the excitement that you receive when you get a new car, isn't it? Is that new car smell. You sit down and you bypass the radio. You're not worried about the GPS. But somebody sits in and you go, just smell that, the new car smell. And you know that because you have children that that new car smell is not going to smell that way very long. But you sit down in that car and that new car smell hits you in the face. And that those seats and you look at the dash and everything so beautiful. But how unfortunate it would be to take the key and stick it in the ignition or to have it on your person somewhere because these new cars, they have the push button start. And you reach up, Brother Kevin, to push that button. And when you push that button, absolutely nothing happens. That would be depressing, wouldn't it? I mean, nothing would be more depressing than to sit in that vehicle. You're ready to start it. You're ready, but you turn the key and nothing happens. So you try it again. Nothing happens. Try it again to no avail. So you pull the hood latch. You get outside. Sister Jeannie, you lift the hood and you look underneath the hood and only to discover that there is no engine in this car. Now, you might still like the gift in reality. Sister Marjorie, it might look really good sitting in your driveway and all your neighbors are pass by and go, wow, they got a brand new car. And then a few weeks later, they see that the car hasn't moved. And then they wonder if you're still in the house alive. It might be something good for the kids to play in, you know? Maybe. But it won't do you any good if you have this bright, shiny, new car, but it's not very functional. In fact, if you cannot use it as it is intended to be used. Now, in a spiritual sense, this is what the church would be like had Pentecost never taken place. This is what the church would be like if Pentecost had never happened. We would be nothing more than a nice, shiny church. We would have a new church smell. We would have all the bells and whistles and the gadgets. But I've come to preach to you today on this Pentecost Sunday that if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost in operation in your life, then folks, you don't have anything. I would rather not be a nice, new, shining church. I would rather be a church that's filled with the excitement of Pentecost. Yes, we believe in speaking in tongues. Yes, we believe in Jesus' name, baptism. Oh, come on, apostolics. Yes, we believe in the power of Pentecost. Put your hands together if you believe in the power of Pentecost. 
Without the Holy Ghost, see this is what separates us from every other church out there. Because without the Holy Ghost, the church is not functional at all. In a spiritual sense, it would be like a car without an engine. It could not do what it is designed to do. So today, we celebrate Pentecost. And I want to us, us to consider its impact. Uh, the impact of Pentecost on the early church and its impact now upon the church today, specifically on us as apostolic people here today. Pentecost did not come and go as some people believe. Pentecost came and it stayed. And I've come to tell you that Pentecost is still alive and in operation today. There are people out there that say Pentecost was then. Nobody speaks in tongues anymore. Well, I've come to tell you they've never been to our church. We still speak in tongues. We still believe that if you want to be saved, you've got to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. Folks, I don't know about you, but that is the only saving power that we have in this church. Not the music, not the teaching, not the preaching. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that does it. Deuteronomy 16 and 13. You shall keep the feast of booze for seven days when you have gathered in from your threshing floors and from your wine presses. Pentecost was the feast day following the Passover of which Jesus was crucified. 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost simply means 50th. The second major Jewish feast was the feast of Pentecost or the feast of of the in gathering. This is the time when they would gather the winter wheat, the winter grains that had been sown, and the early part of June, they would be ready for harvest. The feast of in gathering takes place at the end of the agricultural cycle, just after the last crops have been gathered in. This gathering in does not refer to the actual act of harvest, but rather to the actions performed on the crops after the harvest. Again, you shall keep the feast of booths for seven days when you have gathered in from your threshing floors and from your wine presses. Now, we see from this passage that by the time of the end gathering, the farmers in ancient Israel had gathered into the storehouses the last of the remaining grapes and grains from the outdoor wine presses and the threshing floors. Although the actual grape and grain harvest was completed sometime before this, much work had to go into the harvested produce before it could be eaten. In ancient times, the grapes were processed into wine and raisins in the wine press, which consisted of a floor for treading the grapes and vats for collecting the juice. Grains were processed into kernels and straw on the threshing floor where the stalks were threshed and the kernels were tied together. So the Feast of Pentecost was marked by taking a portion of their field harvested. Now, listen very carefully. I don't want any of this to bore you, but it's very important and interesting facts. Tying the wheat and the sheaves, bringing them in and offering before the Lord was a wave offering as the priest would take the sheaves and wave them before the Lord and offer them before the Lord as first fruits unto God. They would take what they had brought in, they tied them together and they would wave them before the Lord. And they would say, God, to you belongs the first fruit. There's a harvest that is coming in, but this is the first fruit. This belongs to you. And they would give it to God as the first fruits of the increase of their land at the feast of Pentecost, at the feast of their ingathering. And as it was the custom in all Jewish feasts, there would be Jews that gathered in from all over the world to celebrate the feast. And so the day of Pentecost had come. The feast had come. 
that what I find so interesting tonight is that in ancient times, the threshing floors and the wine presses were located outside. As a result, towards the end of the long process of preparing the harvest grapes and grain, the crops would be in danger. They would be in peril by the coming rains that would damage them. Now there's almost no rain in the summer and early autumn in the land of Israel. We read in the word of God of his promise to the people of Israel that if they keep his word, they will have time to gather in their produce from the threshing floors and the wine presses before the coming of the winter rains. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thine oil. And I will send grass in the fields for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. So in addition to the coming rains the Israelite farmers would work furiously to gather in the crops and the outdoor threshing floors and the wine presses to be diligent to his word. I've come to tell you that that whole scene reminds me of today. God has given us an allotted time period here between the rains, if you will. He's given us a time to work between the rains, to work and gather in. We had the former rain, the outpouring on the day of Pentecost, if you will. Amen. The outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I've come to tell you there's another rain coming. I said there's another rain that's coming. And I don't know about you, but God is calling everybody in this place. If you're apostolic, we don't need to waste time on foolishness. We don't need to waste time on being lazy. But we need to go out and gather in. Listen to me. The harvest is out there. Come on, church. I said the harvest is out there. We got to go out and get them and bring them in before the latter rain comes. So to work in the fields, to work in the harvest, folks, as it did back then, we know that we've got to work furiously. You don't know, they, they put everything else off so that they could go out and bring them in. They put everything else aside. Everywhere we go, everything we do, we ought to reflect our anxiousness and our anxiety about what is coming. I'm telling you that if you're apostolic, you need to have a look on your face that you are anxious about what is coming. I've come to tell you that if you're apostolic, you need to be excited that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. If you're apostolic, if you speak in other tongues, you need to be excited that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. And we don't need to sit back and do nothing, but we need to go out into this world and we do encourage them and compel them to come in. It's amazing to me how great of a responsibility that we have. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, a book written around 20 years after Pentecost to a church started by Paul is recorded in Acts chapter 17. This church began and it continued amidst much hostility and opposition from the Jews. This passage powerfully illustrates the kind of impact that the Holy Ghost, the Pentecost, had on people's hearts and lives in the first century. A church made up of redeemed and changed people. Can I tell you today that we are a church that is made up of redeemed and changed people. I don't stand here before you today as someone that was born perfect and stayed perfect until now. But I stand before you today as somebody that was born into sin, that has lived a life of sin. And thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I now stand here. I'm a redeemed person. I'm a changed person. Is there anybody? 
somebody here today that is changed and redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, I want you to put your hands together if you're redeemed by the power of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, by the power of the Holy Ghost, we work diligently, furiously, to bring them in. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now listen, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. I'm so thankful today that when the gospel came, it didn't just come in word, it came in power. Uh, again, we're a testimony here today that when we heard the word, we didn't just go home unchanged. I said when we heard the word, it was a word not only of word, but it was a gospel of power. That when I heard the word, I was pricked in my heart. When I fell at an altar of repentance and repented of my sin, the power of God got a hold of me. And so he says, the power of the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and as of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. He said, you have been noising abroad the words of the gospel. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So, when you think about Pentecost, when you really consider and think about Pentecost, you should first think about the impact of the Holy Ghost, about how the Spirit of God, that there was an outpouring that took place on that day, and the power of the Spirit was given to the church. The message of the gospel had an impact on everybody's life that heard it. I've come to preach to you today on this Pentecost Sunday that people need to see your Pentecost. And that is a question that I ask you today. Can people see your Pentecost? When they look into your face, do they see somebody that's depressed? Do they see somebody that's downhearted? Do they see somebody that's discouraged? Or do they see somebody that is working victoriously in the meantime for the latter, come on somebody, the latter rain is coming and we gotta work and labor and be prepared for what God's gonna do. We have a deep conviction Concerning what the scripture says. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also into power. In Acts chapter 2, the people who heard the message of the gospel through Peter, the Bible says that they were pricked in their hearts. Brother Kevin, their heart was cut when they heard the gospel. They were convicted of their sin and their guilt. And they welcomed gladly the question. Men and brethren, what shall we do here in verse 6 we read you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Ghost true conviction through the work of the Holy Ghost I've come to tell you that it is the work of conviction it is the work of the Holy Ghost that if you've got sin in your life every time you think about it every time you do it you feel bad you struggle you wrestle I've come to preach to you today when the Holy Ghost is working you will feel conviction the Holy Ghost is telling you hey I've delivered you from that oh come on somebody I've set you free from that you don't need to mess with drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and sin any longer I've convicted you come on somebody let the power of the Holy Ghost do what it's supposed to do in your life 
you became followers of us and unto the Lord having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost you know what he said he said you became imitators of us and of the Lord oh this is what's amazing brother John this is what's amazing to me that in spite of severe suffering hey the church was persecuted from the very beginning but sister Marjorie they didn't care the church was being persecuted but they were still the church they were being thrown into prison but they were still the church they were being whipped and abused but they were still the church oh I hope nobody gets discouraged here tonight I hope you lift up your eyes to heaven and say though the whole world hates me I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost come on somebody though the whole world thinks I'm strange I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost it did not deter them from preaching the gospel spreading its truth to other people but the courage and the boldness to do this it didn't come from themselves but it came from the Holy Ghost I'm going to tell you you and I should have the courage today to stand up boldly for what we believe in don't think it's strange when people look at you and say oh you're one of those church people you're one of those Christians you're one of those apostolics ladies you're one of those that just you just dress like you think you're all holy don't listen to the criticism of the enemy you understand who you are in Christ you understand who you are in the spirit and you plug into the power of Pentecost every day of your life when you come into the house of the Lord you wave your hands to the Lord this is why we worship because they waved their hands and they said God this is the first fruit listen if you're thankful for the Holy Ghost you need to give God your first fruits you need to wave your hands to the Lord and you need to say God I'm thankful for what you've given me come on clap your hands to the Lord right now come on I feel the Holy Ghost you've got to become a model to all believers this is how we do it folks I don't want people from the outside to come in here and just watch people going That's not Pentecost. I don't remember reading that on the day of Pentecost, they all sat in stools around tables. And they were drinking coffee and eating donuts. That's not what I see. The Bible says they were in the temple every single day. And they were continually praising God. Why? Because they were looking for the Holy Ghost outpouring to come. They knew that it was going to rain from heaven. That the Holy Ghost would fall on all of them. That's what they were looking for. But now we are between rains. Now we're between rains. And now we get a little uh, preoccupied with ourselves. We no longer come in and praise God as we should. We come in and it takes us a half hour to 45 minutes just to pray through so we can praise God. But we ought to be able to walk into the house of the Lord and say, yep, I've had a crummy week, but I'm in the house of God. Yes, I've had a horrible day, but I've come to praise God. Yes, things are rotten in my life, but I've come to praise God. Tell you something interesting. I'm not trying to embarrass them at all because God knows I love my kids and I never, I don't ever want to use my kids as a quote unquote example. Make people think something. That's not what I'm doing. But I think what he did was was very cute. I think both my boys are very cute. I've missed them all last week and I just want to kiss your cheeks off. But the other day while I was gone, of course, Sister Maroney's done a very good job keeping them in line while dad's been away. And she, uh, something happened, but Connor just made the statement after they did a bunch of stuff. Connor made the statement. He said, well, I've just had a bad day. So mom, being the incredible mother that she is, she says, well, Connor, here's what we're going to do. You're going to sit down and you're going to write all the things down that we did for fun today. And we're going to see if it was a bad day or not. And so he sat down and said, wrote at the top I think it said it was a good day that what it said it was a good day because and so he wrote down 
what, what was it? Went to the park. Went outside. What was it? Got a happy meal. Played with a dog. Built rolls in the sand. Did all kinds of fun stuff. And so Connor made a list. And after he made that list, he realized, you know what? It wasn't such a bad day after all. You know what I think we ought to do sometimes? I think when we have our bad days, you know what we ought to do? We ought to sit down and we ought to write down all the good things that we have in our lives. I think we ought to say first and foremost, I might have had a day, bad day, but thank God I'm baptized in the name of Jesus. Thank God I'm filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank God I've got clothes on my back. I've got food on my table. My kids are not in the hospital. Come on, somebody. I've got a roof over my head. I've got a job. I've got a family. Oh, come on, somebody. You ought to thank God. That's what Pentecost does for you. It helps you remember that we are not as bad off as we think, but we are blessed. Come on, clap your hands if you're blessed. Put your hands together if you're blessed. Thank you, Jesus. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but also in every place of uh, your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You did the job. Do you understand that? Brother Maroney doesn't need to go out and just, you know, blabber mouth. You go out and do the job. You spread the gospel. You tell people in your everyday life about Pentecost. Oh, that we would get this in our hearts. That the word sounded out or rang out in Greek. It means echo or loud noise. So the word, listen, if that's what it means, which it does. The work of the Holy Ghost in them was making an impact in people throughout the whole region. Do you understand? Not just believers. Sister Johnson, it wasn't just believers saying, oh, there's somebody with a testimony. But Sister Jenny, it was people that weren't living for God. That looked at them and heard their words and saw their worship and looked on their face and said, Mr. Brandy, they said, hey, you look happier than me. Come on, somebody. You don't look like some kind of a bump on a dill pickle. You look like you're happy. I say, if you walk around with a frown on your face all day, you need to go home, get on your knees and pray till you talk in tongues. Don't get up till you do. Nobody wants to see you like that anyway. Amen. The Holy Ghost does it lead people to just a private confession of faith, but it leads to a public confession. That's what the Holy Ghost is. They spoke in tongues and all the people from the surrounding nations that were there, the, re, the, the rulers and the leaders, heard them speak in tongues. They turned from their idols, Sister Wallace, one by one. Do you get that? They stopped serving their idols and they started serving God. The message and the response to that message changes people's lives forever. The question that I have is can people see your Pentecost? Is this change of life that demonstrates to others the Holy Ghost in us? Is it effective in your life? Is it evident in your life? Oh, on the day of Pentecost there would be nothing greater than to give the gift back to the Lord and say I worship you for my salvation. I thank you for my salvation. I praise you for my salvation. They didn't just say they believed. They proved that they believed. They proved it in their life. The Holy Ghost had an impact on them. The Spirit of God impacts your life. There needs to be, oh, listen to me, there needs to be excitement and energy and endurance for the kingdom of God. There needs to be a continual wave offering before the Lord. I, I, I believe that God gets so weary of our poor mouthing all the time. Don't you think God gets tired of it? Don't you think God grows weary of us complaining about everything all the time? We have salvation. We will, do you understand? We will, Brother Chester, not go to hell because of our salvation. That's enough to put a smile on. Your car breaks down, but you ain't going to hell. 
Come on, somebody. Your air conditioner quits working. It's 110 degrees outside. But guess what? Hell's a lot harder, and you ain't going to hell. Hell's hotter than that. Well, my oven broke, but you ain't going to hell. My clothes don't fit. That's your own fault, but you ain't going to hell. Right? God gets tired of our poor mouthing when we have salvation. And we need to be thankful for our, listen to me, salvation and the salvation of your family, that ought to be the most important thing in your entire life. More important than your job. More important than your house. Come on, somebody. More important than everything. We got to stop just wanting quantity of church. We got to start having quality of church. And so... You see, the church's expectation is not a passive expectation. It is an active expectation. The great expectation of Jesus coming back is what people should spend their energy working towards. You understand what I'm saying? If I, listen, if I'm doing something and I'm too tired to come to church, shame on me. If I'm too tired to teach a Bible study, shame on me. It should all be for the sake of the kingdom. You're ready to close in just a minute. It's a kingdom that Jesus Christ initiated by his first coming. It's a kingdom that is empowered by the Holy Ghost, working through the message of the gospel to change people's hearts and lives. And it is a kingdom that is being spread through the work of the church, through people like me and you who have been impacted by the Spirit so that we can impact others. The impact of Pentecost teaches us that God's gift of salvation, it comes to us not like a car without an engine but salvation comes to us fully equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit that equips us to live our lives so that other people can see Pentecost there would be nothing greater on Pentecost Sunday than you and I to recommit to the Lord that we would allow people to see Pentecost in us. Now I'm going to tell you something. The way you dress as apostolics is vitally important. The way you live as apostolics is vitally important. But I'm going to tell you something. None of that means anything if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. You may shine up for Sunday service and look like new money. Hair all in place. Skirt ironed, everything right, tie right, covered up, buttoned up, blowed up. But if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life, you're nothing but a Lexus without an engine. And it doesn't do you a bit of good. You might look good to some people, but you have no function. You have no purpose. I've come to tell you, folks, we need to understand that the power of the Holy Ghost in us and in our church is the most important thing. When people walk through those doors, Brother Kevin, I want them to instantly feel the Holy Ghost. I want them to get goosebumps because the Spirit of God is already here. When the praise team is singing, you know why people can stand there and worship? You know why we can pray for each other and why tears can flow? I'll tell you why. Because it's the power of the Holy Ghost working in our lives. Stand with me right now and clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, everybody, clap your hands and let's thank God. Come on, let's praise him for the power of Pentecost in our lives. What I'm going to have you do in just a minute is I'm going to have you come. And I'm going to have you stand at this altar. And we're going to worship God together as a body. And we're going to wave our hands to the Lord. And we're going to pray for the power of Pentecost in our lives. Yes. You'll have to forgive me. Because I just spent a week at a youth camp where every night was... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? High energy. I got one more week to go. And I hate to tell you, but my physical body can only take so much. I'm not running 5Ks, Brother Jamal, like I used to. But I could tell you, your physical body right now may not feel like doing much. 
but my spirit is full my heart is full and even though I'm tired and even though it's been a rough week sister Wallace I can't help but throw up my hands I can't help but lift my voice come on somebody I can't help but worship God because the power of Pentecost is alive in my life I wonder if you could come let's all come and gather in and I want you to lift your hands and just begin to worship God together I want you to wave your hands to the Lord and say